in the words of George Orwell, author of 1984, Big Brother is watching you. One does not establish a dictatorship in order to safeguard a revolution. One makes a revolution in order to establish a dictatorship. Welcome to Don's Diorama. It's Sunday 12th of May and tonight I'm joined by Mikhail Salen, a prolific journalist and researcher for the Seattle Examiner and a writer also for Infowars, Natural News and Intel Hub. Mikhail has joined me to discuss the expanding surveillance state and what the purpose behind the development, implementation and use of this expensive surveillance technology is, the main motivations for it, who's behind it and what steps we can take to limit such invasive tracking of our lives where possible. And we'll also be discussing the impact of CISPA on the constitutional rights of Americans as regards their privacy and Orwellian surveillance programmes such as INDECT which Nicholas West of the Activist Post describes as Big Brother's full-spectrum surveillance project and also trap wire. Mikhail is joining me, uh, as I just said. Um, So how are you, Mikhail, first of all? I'm pretty good. How are you? I'm pretty good too, yeah. Um, We just had a a mini-drama before we came online. I lost my internet connection, but yeah, rapidly got it back. And then the stream happened to fall down as well, so we're a few minutes late in starting tonight. Um, First of all, Mikhail, I'd like to ask you a wee bit about your background and how you got to the point of being a journalist and how you got into specifically political writing um, writing about the corporate machine and, all, and whatnot, and obviously about the and get got interested in surveillance specifically. Could you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, sure. You know, I kind of grew up really a neocon. wasn't really into politics. You know, I um, didn't really pay much attention. I didn't really care, honestly. And then um, a couple years ago, I don't even really remember what it was specifically, but <clears throat> I started kind of learning about a lot of things uh, in the political realm. And uh, I kind of got the basic understanding that, okay, we have a pretty corrupt government. And then after I learned about things like um, Bohemian Grove and some other interesting things, like uh, many people probably remember when the United States, uh, um, one of their biggest defense contractors, DynCorp, got caught running sex slavery rings uh, all over you know the Middle East and whatnot. And uh, you know uh, we have a representative here, Cynthia McKinney, who exposed Donald Rumsfeld you know, on C-SPAN – um, about that. So once I learned those things, I said, okay, this isn't just, you know, we're not just working for corrupt people here. Uh, you know, we got really crazy people in charge. So uh, that, along with the Ron Paul campaign, kind of uh, got me really interested in writing. And basically, I had a friend who wrote for Examiner, and she said, hey, you should write. And I was like, okay, I'll do that because, you know, there's very few people in my area telling it like it is, if you will. Um, So I started writing, and things kind of just, you know, that was only maybe eight, nine months ago, and ever since then, things have just been blown up, so it's been pretty cool. That's very impressive, yeah. Okay, let's uh, talk a bit about your your writing, first of all, before we actually go into the the surveillance stuff. Now, being an author of numerous political articles, which ones have resonated most with you, and have you found have been maybe the hardest hitting in terms of their impact on the reader? Well, interestingly... Um, man, it was an article a couple months ago, and it was it was before I had really you know gotten picked up by a lot of bigger websites. But I wrote an article about a woman in Oregon. Uh, she went to Walmart and she bought some Halloween decorations, and inside the Halloween decorations, she found a note from a Chinese slave labor prisoner that was like, "Help me, I'm in this area." <coughs> so basically, I said, "Okay, that's an interesting story. I'll write about that." But you know, being the way I write, I try to tie in some other things. So I tied in, hey, ironically, the United States has inmate labor programs. And I, you know, linked to the army.mil website. I linked to some other army documents about, you know, uh, internment camps and whatnot. And for some reason, the article within like a day or two got 33,000 Facebook likes and 130,000 views. And, um, all of a sudden, all those links to the army manuals, they all got taken off the article. And I was like, okay, that's kind of weird. So I went and put them back in. They got taken out. I went and put them back in. They got taken out. So after six times, I finally had to go copy, paste all the links at the end of the article in long form to all these army documents, which was kind of interesting. Uh, that's never happened before. So that was one of the first articles that seemed to make a big impact. Yeah. Well, that's very interesting. Um, okay. 
moving on now to surveillance, right, as it's quite a growing concern of many. Um, so just where is the line drawn? At what point is it conflicting against constitutional rights of the individual in terms of their privacy? For example, like with the internet, do you think they're going... We could talk, maybe talk about CISPA here. Um, do you think that they're going pretty far with the, with this bill? Do you think it's invasive or do you think there's any good parts about it? Well, th the thing I think people need to understand is that many of the things they're trying to pass, they're already doing. A lot of people, you know, always point to the Patriot Act, you know, which is horrible and terrible. But under uh, President Clinton, we had Operation Echelon, where basically NSA whistleblowers have said every single phone call in the 1990s was stored in a database. So all this – the government seems to do illegal things, and then they come out later and try to pass legislation to legalize it. So my view has always been that – if they say they want to do something, they're already doing it, most likely. So, I mean, we had a NSA whistleblower named uh, William Benny who came forward recently and said, every text message, every email, every phone call is all stored. They're not necessarily listened to in live time, but, you know, your information gets stored. So then if the government doesn't like you, then go back and access all this information. And the governments argue that, hey, since we're not listening, you know, in real time to your conversation, it's really not violating your Fourth Amendment right. We don't need a warrant, but they're just storing it every like in huge databases, you know. Yeah, warrantless wiretapping. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay, so that could lead us on to like Trapwire and Index. Have you? I, t I know you mentioned Trapwire. I take it you've heard of Index as well. I've heard of it briefly. I haven't read into it too much, though. Okay, yeah, I have a little bit of information about Indict, but could I first ask you about Trapwire, what you know yeah. about Trapwire? Trapwire was basically a software program that the government ran through, uh, you know, video cameras, surveillance cameras in cities that ran facial recognition software and other recognition software to just pick people up. And there was only two cities that were running it. One of them was Seattle, and they were basically pilot programs where the government put this software into these cameras. And uh, they basically were, you know, like I said, doing facial recognition as well as they were looking at the way people walked and trying to recognize different styles of walking to pinpoint people through that. So they didn't want anyone to know about this. I believe it was WikiLeaks who exposed that they were doing this. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. There is some, yeah, there is, sorry. Um, something about WikiLeaks, uh, they're describing Trapwire as a government spy network that uses ordinary surveillance cameras. So they mm -hmm. basically ta um, tapped into the surveillance cameras and put in this like facial recognition, all this kind of creepy, sinister stuff. Quite, quite disturbing, really. Because um, it is... It's, you think that it, there's some sort of behaviour analysis going on as well, like in psychological profiling and whatnot? Oh, for, for sure. We also have um, a lot of things popping up. Crime prediction software, I've written about that twice uh, in yeah. Seattle and some other places where they basically have a huge system that crunches numbers of the date, the time, and the place that crime happens. And then there's an algorithm that's similar to the one used to predict earthquakes, supposedly, that they use, and they say, okay, we see a lot of crimes happening at this time in this area, so we're going to station police in this area. So it's not that nefarious in a way, but you know, people are worried that cops are going to start seeing people in these high-crime areas and assume that they're committing a crime because the computer said so and go up to them and start hassling them, you know, ask to search them and saying, oh, you're suspicious because the computer says you're suspicious, you know. Yeah, just going back to about the facial recognition, um, I don't know if you've heard of the. There's supposed to be these infrared masks that can hide, you can use to hide your face from the cameras. Yeah, uh, there's several things people have been doing. Um, there's pe people have been painting their faces certain ways, and mm -hmm. then the camera can't distinguish that you're a face. Um, obviously, you would probably stick out quite a bit if you were wearing some weird uh, patterned face makeup. Um, there's also the mask, but a good one I saw was people were putting these LED lights into ball caps, you know, baseball hats, putting LED lights all inside, and then they hide a battery in the back of the hat, and they turn it on. And so when the camera sees you, all it sees is a bright light where your face is. 
Excellent. Yeah. So um, just before we move on, um, Index. Uh, now, according to the Singularity Hub in 2009, they described it basically as a wide-ranging five-year plan to bring passive and active monitoring to almost every aspect of public life in the EU. Hardware and software platforms to monitor public spaces for abnormal behaviour. So just, again, psychological and behavioural pro- uh, profiling and whatnot. Um, special search engines for images and documents using ubiquitous hidden digital watermarks. Now, Google, did they not have specific uh, search engines where they could, uh, like, and um, how to say this, uh, individualised searches, basically. So, like, if you put something in in a search um, it's going to be totally different. Your search results are going to be totally different. If somebody puts the same thing in from a different location, um, they're going to have totally different search results specific to them, providing, of course, they're not using any sort of uh, uh, proxy or whatever to kind of mask where they are and um, what they're doing and, you know. Yeah, exactly. Google does do that, and uh, that's why I don't use Google because um, I don't know if you heard the news also. With Google Earth, you know, that you can go view um, the Earth, and they have Google Street View, where you can see streets, um, pictures of streets around cities. You're familiar with this? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And apparently well, they were... Oh, sorry, no. You yeah, can. that's... Yeah, exactly. Their, uh, their Google Street View cars, they got caught having a software program on them, and when they were driving through the city taking pictures, they were actually stealing people's... Uh, credit card information, uh, Wi-Fi uh, passwords and all this off their computers as they were driving by people's houses. And that was mainstream news even, and they had to admit that they were doing it, but, you know, of course they didn't get any trouble. Sorry, I was waiting. I thought you were going to say something else there. Um, right. What I find um, quite alarming, moving on from this, I mean, that is alarming in itself, but also what I, another thing I find quite alarming is how simple it is for law enforcement to abuse their power when using such Orwellian technology. For example, to be used to prosecute or imprison without prosecution? And will it be used to stop crime or pre-crime? I mean, yeah, I'm sure all of it's going to be used against us. I've also even heard of technology now where they have police. I've never heard of it being used um, in any certain situation, but I've heard that they do have this technology coming out where police have a device and they can just scan it by your cell phone. It'll take all the information off your cell phone. So that's a another thing of you know the Fourth Amendment being violated without a warrant. Mm. Yeah, it's, I mean it's it's affecting a lot of the. Uh, I mean, when you look at your constitution, it's it's impacting on more than one uh, aspect. Obviously, like with the CISPA, that's impacting on the. Um, I don't know if you want to elaborate. I mean, I suppose you might have the same idea here about the things that it's impacting on uh, as regards the censorship, etc. I don't know if you want to elaborate more on that. Yeah, CISPA, I mean, they've tried to pass stuff like that uh, multiple times now. I'm glad it hasn't passed. But, <clears throat> you know, like I said, a lot of the things that CISPA does, it uh, it is already going on. I mean, we see a lot of censorship right now. I've seen on, uh, I mean, even on Facebook, I've just in the past couple months since I started writing, I've seen massive censorship on a lot of political pages where with Facebook's new algorithms, big pages with, you know, 100,000 plus likes used to get thousands of shares and now they're down to hundreds. And I see these big political pages all just all of a sudden, you know, almost overnight losing their reach. And I've had uh, similar experiences with censorship where, uh, you know, my viewership just goes down rapidly um, <clears throat> quite often now, more than it ever did before, despite me having more exposure and getting posted on bigger places than before. So there's a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes, I think, already that's uh, pretty nefarious. Yeah. Now, we've touched on some um, already, some methods of surveillance already, such as obviously the facial recognition and whatnot, and the C- and the, uh, we did speak about the CCTV cameras. Apparently, in the UK, there is over 4 million CCTV cameras. Um, and also, uh, in America, I'm not sure if there are, they are in the UK as well, but there is license plate reading cameras as well. Yeah. Yeah, they have those up here. Uh, Seattle is yeah. trying to deploy them right now, actually. Now, um, as regards mobile phones, 
I mean, what what are their capabilities in terms of tracking people? Well, a lot of people don't realize that ever since the 1996 Telecommunications Act in the United States, every single cell phone has the ability to be tapped into by the federal government, all under the guise of, you know, oh, what if you're lost in the desert and, you know, the government needs to track you. So cell phones pretty much, since, you know, the beginning of cell phones almost, have had the ability to be tracked. Um... So, you know, especially with these, um, a lot of these big companies like Verizon and AT&T, they directly work with the CIA on many occasions. Uh, there's news articles that come out all the time about, you know, groups, like I said, Verizon, et cetera, that uh, give up information all the time when requested by the government, and those numbers keep going up every year. So I personally carry my cell phone, which I don't even use to make phone calls. But I carry it in a special pouch that blocks all uh, GPS and uh, signals. So, you know, that's one way. I like just to stick it to the man. Yeah, it's great. It's great. I mean, like, offering, like, ways to... Yeah, we could go back to, actually, the CISPA and how... What kind of message... I suppose when I mentioned uh, things like proxies now, what kind of other messages are there or that people can use to kind of... Maybe not necessarily CISPA, but, like, to just surveillance in general to stop like being surveilled or online activities or like, yeah, at I least mean, limit it yeah i mean it's the thing is you you gotta it's, it all depends what you want to do in the internet i mean i you know need to use facebook i need to use youtube and whatnot uh, yeah. as part of journalism so those are things that are you know there's a lot of things on those websites that kind of read into what you're doing. So it's you kind of have to find a balance because if you truly want to be not able to be seen on the internet, you know, you're also not going to be able to do many things. So I mean, one of the great things, uh, simple things people can do is get a VPN um which I use um which, you know, um basically what that does is that your internet provider, whoever it is, whatever company it is, you know, they can see basically everywhere you're going, what you're doing, <clears throat> and a VPN just changes your IP address so your internet service provider can't really see what you're doing, basically, unless they uh, ask for the VPN and you try to get a good VPN that doesn't give up the information. Yeah, so that's really important because people can um, they don't just assume that every VPN will not give up your information, you know, um, to authorities, some, some will. And I just got to say, and and I always try to tell people, you know, it's not about hiding what you're doing. Uh, you know, I don't, yeah, yeah. I'm pretty boring. I don't really do anything cool. So there's nothing worth saying what I do even, but uh, it's about, you know, asserting your fourth amendment right. And, you know, this whole moronic mindset of, well, if you have nothing to hide, you know, that's garbage, you know. Absolutely. And I mean, I'm, I'm not obviously American, so we don't really have the same kind of constitution. Um, but at the same time, it's, uh, we have believe in a right to privacy you know and uh, these are extremely invasive and they're basically just uh, eroding eroding our rights um, and it's it's time to make a stand against this um, but if we, if we could actually move on to RFID because that's quite big as well especially with RFID microchips and how that all links into like the transhumanist agenda and whatnot. Um, first of all, can we maybe talk about what RFID is first before we go into that? Yeah, RFID are just basically little uh, radio frequency tags. Um, they're in everything, really. Uh, they're in clothing. Um, you know, they're on credit cards and whatnot. Um, and it's just, you know, a way of uh, keeping information. And, they, yeah, of course, they can also be used to track you. Um, I actually have a RFID repelling wallet that I have that, uh, so, you know, none of my uh, credit cards that have no money on them can be swiped and taken. Yeah. Um, apparently, like, they were planning to... I think it was in HR4872. I'm not sure what's happening with that bill at the moment, but where whether it's been... Uh, anyway, uh, there was a clause in it about RFID being introduced and, like, the microchips obviously and being implantable um, behind, in the back of the hand or up uh, the inner upper arm. Um, and these could actually track a yeah, GPS tracker. They could track your every movement. Um, and eventually, I mean, there was even speculation, which 
all kind of does tie into, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure, are you familiar with the transhumanist agenda? Yes, I am. Uh, not, yeah. I'm not versed extremely in it, but I understand what it is and the psychopaths who follow it. Yeah, because it kind of, it, it seems to be heading in that direction very much so, especially with the, how, like, I mean, if you look obviously back at, for those who aren't familiar with the transhumanist agenda, I suppose, um, is if you look at Terminator movie and you look at how humans are, have robot are behaving like robots in it and the robots are having the human emotions to make you feel sorry for them that's kind of the same principle of what the transhumanist agenda is what um they're trying to move us towards with these rfid chips and they're talking about eventual um i'm not saying it's going to happen but i'm saying that it's it's been discussed openly about them implanting chips and I suppose actually has it already happened with uh, certain patients have had uh, under the guise of for medical reasons had plant uh, RFIDs. Yeah, there's also the uh, to con- yeah. Oh, I was just going to say yeah. There's also a pretty famous video on YouTube. It was right sometime after nine eleven where a woman was like, "I'm planting my whole family because we're so worried." about, uh, you know, things since 9-11. So there is videos of people voluntarily putting these into, uh, you know, in their family members to keep track of them, supposedly. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's uh, very disturbing. Um, and also, I mean, they were moving, supposedly, towards a cashless society. And, yeah, okay, you could be argued that we're already in some form of a cashless society when we've got the credit cards, we've got the debit cards and whatnot. Well... We're still using for debit cards, uh, well, credit cards more so, obviously. But uh, with the RFID chips eventually being used, like if you were going into a shop, um, you your RFID chip, you would need to have an RFID chip to be able to buy stuff. And if you didn't um, have one, then you couldn't get in the shop to buy things like that. Um, or to use a library, for example. I mean, I'm not... <sighs> I'm kind of on the fence with this. I'm not sure how... I can I can kind of see that it might happen, but, you know, I'm, I'm not entirely sure at the moment. Um, but I, I do see that things are definitely going towards a, an a, oppressive direction anyway. I can see that there is some form of uh, police state definitely unfolding, especially, I mean, you see it more so in America with the likes of the... Well, they've pushed this CISPA. I'm not sure if it's actually... Has it passed the House? Uh, I believe it passed the House, but... Or no, it passed the Senate, I believe, and then I think it stalled in the House, and I, I think it was defeated in the House, so it's, it's oh, dead well, for now. Oh, well, that's good. Yeah. It's dead for now, yeah. They'll bring it back under a, a different name, no doubt. Yeah, exactly. Like we usually do and try and um, under a, a, get it in somehow. Um but also, yeah, like NDAA and the Patriot Act are very, very disturbing. Uh, the Patriot Act's obviously been around a lot longer, but the NDAA is very new. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, a lot of people uh, were very upset by the indefinite detention provisions inside the NDAA, so that's woken a lot of people up, which is a good thing. Absolutely. Um now, we've covered, I don't know if you know, if, what about the TAC as well? I mean, they're obviously, that there is an element of surveillance with them as well, because obviously people um, going going through these scanners and their their body images are actually, can be saved, you know, to the computer systems. Have you heard mm-hmm. of, about that? And, oh, yeah, about, Definitely. And then about the mobile surveillance scanner vans. Mm-hmm, those also, yeah. Um, yeah, the TSA is are nefarious liars. Uh, they said, oh, you know, we're not keeping these images, and then it turned out they were keeping the images, uh, the naked body scans. Um, although it looks like a lot of uh, these scanners are getting removed from a lot of airports, which is a good thing. Um, I don't know. I'm sure something more nefarious will be put in. But, yes, they also have uh, mobile vans that supposedly can drive around New York and just drive past people and just blast them with some radiation and see if they have any weapons on anything. Of course, this is a complete violation of the Fourth Amendment, you know, searching people without probable cause. So, yeah, they're just kind of going 
above and beyond, it seems, trying to do whatever they can. And most of the public doesn't seem to care because, you know, I got nothing to hide, they say. Yeah. So <laughs> it's unfortunate. And just treating this like cattle, really. Um, mm-hmm. So, what, I mean, why go to such lengths to develop all these ki- different kinds of expensive surveillance technology, um, implement it, and what, what do you think their main goals and motivations are here? What's, what arguments have been used to prop up this state surveillance of its relatively docile population? Yeah, well, I mean, there's there's different levels. You know, we have the lowest level little, uh, you know, the guys who, you know, the police and the military and whatever. And I'm not saying all police are all military or all FBI are bad. But, uh, you know, they, they believe the little garbage they're fed and trained that, you know, Al-Qaeda is under every table, even though it's a mainstream news that we're funding them in Syria right now. You know, they believe that domestic extremists are everywhere, even though... They're not, and they believe, you know, that terrorist attacks are imminent, even though New York Times admitted that 17 terror plots were staged and carried out by the FBI, and they foiled their own plots. So it's really theater more than anything. Um, gun crime is down in the United States 49% since 1992, but they say they need to save us from all the gun crime. Um, so it's it's mostly, there's no reason really for it. It's all just, you know, theater. Yeah, I mean, look at Switzerland and they all have guns over there, yet the crime rate's relatively low in comparison. Um, so, like, because basically, I suppose it's, it's acting as a deterrent. Like, if, if a robber, they would think twice about going to somebody's house that actually had a gun. Um, the person wouldn't even have to fire a shot to for them to be deterred because, you know, if someone else has got a gun, you know, your chance of getting out without a scrape is far reduced so it kind of makes people think before mm-hmm. they commit crimes I think so that would probably be the rationale a big part of the rationale for that what um, well I was going to skip that question but I think wait a minute what is the role of the police in rolling out this widespread deeply invasive surveillance and, and what conflicts of interest or abuses of power are being witnessed as the surveillance technology becomes even more sophisticated result in, in the continuing growth and expansion of the police state? Well, it's my belief that a lot of the uh, <clears throat> good cops, you know, the good constitutional officers that just want to do their job and be a public servant are kind of uh, getting weeded out and so they're just getting people in who will just, you know, take orders. You know, I, I see videos of this all the time, you know, where a guy pulls up to a warrantless checkpoint in America, you know, 100 miles from the border, and they say, you know, we're Border Patrol, you need to answer these questions. And, you know, they say, hey, I'm just following orders, you know. Um, you know, it sounds like what they said at the Nuremberg trial with the Nazis. So, uh, yeah, they're just uh, carrying out, doing what they're told, because, like I said, they're receiving all this training that, you know, the boogeyman's under the table, and sadly, many of them believe it. And, of course, if you look at all the training manuals in the United States, it's not for al-Qaeda and the Muslims or whatever, you know, that they say in the media. It's for the American citizens who are against the police state, who are against surveillance, basically anyone who's politically active. So Yeah, I get you. Um does a policy of coming down hard in so-called terrorism with sophisticated systems of surveillance prevent or provoke hostilities? And is this technology making any positive difference or just further invading people's privacy and stripping away the freedoms of law-abiding citizens? Yeah, well, uh, Benjamin Franklin said those who give up sec- uh, give up liberty for security get neither. Um, look at the Boston bombing, regardless of what you think happened there. They had hundreds of police, hundreds of military, all right there at the starting line, and they didn't stop anyone. Um, they had bomb-sniffing dogs. They didn't stop anyone. So this idea that they can stop these events from happening is uh, bogus, really. Um, they can't keep you safe. Government's not going to keep you safe. Look at huge natural disasters in the United States, like Hurricane Katrina and whatnot. Uh, people were out there starving. You know, the government's not going to save you. So, um, I'm, I mean, I'm sure there's some legitimate things that the government stopped. But, uh, you know, let's look at the underwear bomber, for example, Abdul Muttalib. Um, Under Secretary of State Patrick Kennedy admitted live on C-SPAN that he was forced to put him on the plane... So that was another example of the FBI, you know, setting up an event and then stopping it and then patting themselves on the back and saying, see, we keep you safe, when really, again, like I said, it's all just political theater. Yeah. So what laws can people invoke to protect them? Well, 
I mean, it all depends on the situation, but a lot of this just boils down to the Fourth Amendment, um, possibly even the First Amendment, um, you know. But mostly just, you know, the Fourth Amendment, you have a right to not have yourself searched or your property searched or your person searched without a warrant. Um, unfortunately, it's hard to invoke that on the computer, especially when a lot of people don't realize uh, they're being surveilled, or even more so when people, you know, people sign up for Facebook and, you know, it, it's an open, it's a public thing, so your information can be used against you pretty much. And uh, I, I've kind of seen that, you know, social networking's been really great. It's kind of like the Matrix, you know, uh, you got to go in the Matrix to stop the Matrix, you know. It's like Facebook is like data mining 101 area, you know, for any government agency. They all openly admit that they're all over Facebook. Um, but, you know, it's also the best place to go and interact with people, so it's kind of uh, attempting to use the system against them, or at least the corrupt elements of the system. Yeah, it's um, it's very it is very good for networking. Um, but yeah, don't give your real information, um, because really it's just it's a as you say it's data mining. Um, CIA book basically that's what I like to refer to. It's a big CIA database <laughs> or MI five, MI six, whatever. Um, yeah. Uh, so stepping into the globalist mindset for a moment with this. Question, is it possible to build a cage that the unsuspected societal test subjects eventually grow to love? And how would you go about convincing them to be thankful for the cage they're in? Yeah, man, I mean, that's, you know, there's many things you can say. We can talk about Edward Bernays, you know, the modern father of propaganda, uh, you know, Joseph Goebbels, uh, the Nazi propaganda minister. He did a lot of... Uh, things that he learned from him so there's <clears throat> things like that there's the hegelian dialectic problem reaction solution you know it, it's pretty much like you were, we were talking about earlier with the uh the terrorism you know they create the problem they stage events or provocateur events or you know set up patsies which is you know documented facts new york times abc news um and then people think oh man they're keeping me safe you know i love the surveillance state i see it you know on comments everywhere um, <clears throat> like for example in Seattle they set up a whole bunch of uh, Homeland Security funded surveillance cameras and everyone was saying hey if you got nothing to hide this is great they're going to keep it safe you know even though more Americans die every year from honeybee stings than they do from terrorism you know you're eight times more likely to die from a police officer in the United States than you are a terrorism so again you know it's, it's, it's this fear mindset they put out and everyone loves their surveillance everyone loves getting uh their Fourth Amendment violated because they think they're being kept safe when really if you study a history book, government is usually the most dangerous thing. And that sounds radical to a lot of brain dead people, but that's the fact whether they like it or not. So how did how did the police state in the USA how does it compare to other police states across the globe? It's an interesting question. Um and it's it's kinda hard to tell. I do know that over there in the UK you guys have a lot of cameras. You were talking about that earlier. Um, mm. You have a whole bunch of cameras, and I've seen I've seen some interesting videos where uh, people go interview people in the UK on the street, and they ask them about the cameras, and they're like, "Oh, I didn't even see the cameras; they had no idea they were there." Um, I think you know it's it's really hard to tell because a lot most of the surveillance is kind of behind the scenes. So um, you know, I, I'm not really familiar with a lot of other countries um, how bad theirs is, but I, I do oh. think that. The United States and uh, the UK, the the big Western countries, are um, under a lot of heavy surveillance due to them having you know higher technology. Of course, places like China are even worse in some uh, aspects than our place with at least internet sh censorship that they have. A lot of people there, a lot of websites are blocked in China, and um, there was actually a lot of mainstream news groups who were saying CISPA was very similar to Chinese style censorship. Uh, Russia is also uh, pretty bad, along with China as well. Yeah, it's kind of moving in a kind of. I mean, China is a very communist regime, and it seems to be kind of moving in that direction as regards to likes of CISPA and the censorship. And um, earlier, I, I spoke about the censorship, but something I didn't mention was the freedom. Of the our freedom of speech has been going to be impacted on with it, bills like these as well. Um, so there's quite a lot of quite an a lot of impact. As regards these things, we didn't. Uh, I meant to mention nanotech earlier on. Um, what do you know about nanotechnology? A little bit. I know that it's uh, it's basically RFID, but extremely small. Obviously, uh, nano, microscopic size. 
Um, I've heard everything from it being in food. Um, I've also heard of uh, things where they can drop, like, just a whole bunch of nanotech, you know, above certain areas uh, out of helicopters or whatever. I've seen some articles on that. So it's it's basically a, a smaller size um, of RFID in a way. Um, and again, of course, it's not very good for your health, obviously, having uh, all these uh, waves going through your body. But, you know, that's pretty much what we see already with cell phones and, and uh, smart meters on houses and whatnot. We just mentioned in the chat about nanomarker weapons, DNA markers. I've not actually heard of them. But I don't know if you have... Kill. No, I don't think I no, I don't think I've heard oh. of either of those. I know there's some weapons that uh disrupt that do disrupt the uh DNA, um, break it apart, but uh I've never heard of uh, anything as far as nanotech weapons. Lee, could could you maybe elaborate just a bit on that for us quickly before I move on to the next question? No? Okay, that's all right. Right, let's move on then. Um, when we're looking at surveillance, the motivations behind it, often government spokespeople will say things like, we have to use this invasive technology for your own good, it's to protect you against terrorism, blah, 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 war on terror, Al-Qaeda, war on terror, Osama bin Lala. Okay, joking aside, it's all in the name of homeland security. So what is terrorism other than a means to enforce a blanket charge against people without the need for habeas corpus? Much like other instances of similar accusational environments like witch hunting? Yeah, I mean, terrorism, I mean, by definition is basically, you know, terrorizing someone to get a political for a political end, you know, uh, which, so we can basically call a lot of things terrorism if we really wanted. Um, yeah, they're basically using this terrorist boogeyman um, to just do whatever they want, and they keep trying to invoke, you know, things like 9-11 to make people, so you don't, don't you remember how scared you were from 9-11, you know? Um, so yeah, basically, you know, the war on terror is a hoax for the reason that, you know, at least, you know, my government, CIA, criminal elements, you know, we created al-Qaeda in 1979 from the Mujahideen uh, soldiers to propel the Soviets out of Afghanistan. And they've been getting funded ever since. Under Bush, uh, there was uh, al-Qaeda being funded in Somalia. We see it more open than ever during uh, the Obama administration with Libya and Syria. Although, you know, the government just likes to basically take – al-Qaeda jihadists plop them somewhere on the map, call them rebels, and say that they're awesome and great as they're caught beheading people and killing children. So, you know, basically when they want al-Qaeda to be good, you know, they're loving rebels who just want democracy, and then, you know, any other time they're in a country they want to take over, then all of a sudden they need to stop them to keep it safe. So, yeah, it's it's the big facade. Yeah, totally. Um, so, yeah, um... What other, what countries in, oh, you didn't want to get that? <laughs> no. What countries and in what time frame will biometrics become part of normal everyday activity? Like the TSA leaving the airport to head to subway stations, etc.? Yeah, we already see that. A lot of people don't realize there was an article, I believe it was New York Times, that um, in 2011 alone there was over 9,000 TSA highway checkpoints where they're working with different groups, uh, sheriffs, uh, highway patrol, to check cars, you know, to keep them safe from terrorism. So I think they do want to push that out more, but I, I do see more and more a backlash from the American people against this um, which is good. Um, we I just wrote about recently there was a marathon here in Washington State and they said, okay, because of the Boston Marathon, we need to have more police. We need to have Department of Homeland Security. They even had a a Border Patrol helicopter that's supposed to be, you know, on the border. That's its only jurisdiction, surveilling over the uh, over this marathon. They had a rule: no backpacks allowed, you know. And if you had any bags, they were subject to search. So they're trying to do this and 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 you see it going out <clears throat> in the sports arena first where they're doing it at football games you know which is where most of the lemmings are that will give up to uh, these things no offense to anyone who likes sports you know um but yeah so but i mean i i think there's going to be a large backlash to it if they keep trying to step the bounds um you know it's hard to really gauge it but i i do see kind of a backlash going towards this uh kind of on, on the ground surveillance of, uh, you know, papers, please. So, where, in your opinion, is all of this heading? Like, for example, 
<laughs> something out of 1984 or something even more insidious. Well, a lot of people have even said that we're beyond 1984 already. Um, but, I mean, it's headed where every control freak, nightmare, collectivist government heads, um, you know, which is... Uh, we already have many um, things in the United States, uh, army training manuals that talk about um, taking political dissidents and putting them in internment camps. Uh, that was pretty big news when it broke here not too long ago. Um, of course, no mainstream media picked it up, although the military did admit that it was real. So that's where it's headed. It's headed where anyone who speaks against the government is uh, is a terrorist. And you see that in our news also now. They're no longer saying you know, Al-Qaeda is the boogeyman. As much now, they're saying it's the homegrown terrorists because they're trying to flip the script. Because that's what I tell people: you know, the whole terror apparatus from 2011 on was never meant for Muslims or anything like that. It was meant for the American people, but they had to use Muslims as the guys to build up this huge police state. And now that they have it near its completion, now they're turning it inward on the American people. And you know, I've known that. You know, since I first started learning about this kind of stuff. So, um, yeah, so it's going to be turned on the American people. We see that. We're going to, the government just wants a nightmare control system where it's just a bunch of control freaks running everything where they rip us off, uh, like they are, um, financially and everything. Um, and they get away with everything, insider trading and whatnot. But yet, if you jaywalk, you get a $500 ticket from the, uh, you know, law enforcement that are revenue generators. Hi, Michelle. That, I mean, that's one level. We could go. We could go beyond that um, if we want to talk about what you know their nefarious thoughts are beyond that. The globalists, at least. But yeah. Hey, how's it going? Uh, hi, Yemon. Um, Paul here. We've um, we've got stories uh, released just recently in the UK of uh, nano marker. It's a weapon that can be used um, to fire at individuals. Um, supposedly, it's to uh, identify people that have fleed from the scene of a crime, but it, it targets everybody uh, in its path. So, yeah, it's supposed to be for fleeing culprits, but it targets everyone. Do you think it we're too far away from such weapons being used and then drones being used to track individuals? <laughs> Not at all. Uh, here in the United States, I don't know if you remember the case with Christopher Dorner. He was the LAPD officer who uh, kind of lost it and went on a shooting rampage. They were talking about using drones to find him. And uh, so, I mean, I... I mean, that just not too long ago, Obama passed a uh, signed legislation for the FAA to allow up to 20,000 to 30,000 drones to be in our sky in the next decade. So they're heading in that direction. Um, and like I was talking about earlier, they do have devices, <clears throat> I haven't seen them deployed heavily yet, where they can just swipe something past your pocket and take your cell phone um, information out. So, yeah, so I think we're definitely headed in that direction. Yeah, well, we just lost Dawn from the call uh, and also Lee and loads of her. We just lost. About, I don't know if you just noticed that. Um, so yeah. Yeah, maybe um, maybe I'm bad luck or something. I don't know. Oh, I don't know, man. I mean, this is the dark. <laughs> this is the dark city. At least it's not a technical issue on our side tonight. But there you go. Dawn's back with us just in the nick of time. Uh, I just proposed the question, Dawn, that Lee had put uh, about the um, the marker, the weapon that's being used, and whether or not we were too far a leap away from drones being used um, to target. Um, these IF, IFD chips, are they? IFID. IFID, IFID uh, chips. So anyway, welcome back, Dawn. Yes, catch my breath. Oh, had to reset the, the router there. That's twice in one night, just before the show, and now towards the end. That never happens. <laughs> but yeah, that was quite... Um, maybe maybe quite I have some federal, federal handlers angry that I'm on the show, I don't know. Yeah, maybe they don't like us talking about surveillance. Ma Michael, stuff. you did make a, a really valid point about um, certain numbers and, and being restricted. Uh, we've noticed this within YouTube and YouTube now being just eaten up by part of the uh, Google. Um, and, and I've come across this. Uh, it's really interesting the, the, the facts that um, the numbers don't go up uh, unless now, of course, you're willing to pay for it. And then they can guarantee it. I mean, how could you guarantee this? Um if, 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 you know, people, I don't say how they could do it. Um, so, yeah, you made some uh, really interesting points, Michael, uh, really interesting points. It's a subject that I've only kind of just touched on, really. I mean, I kind of get it from my passport and stuff. And then recently I've seen insect drones. I mean, what? 
then you take the capabilities we're talking about for these things to just be released and track an individual, um, basically using the mobile phones or, or, or anything. We're not too... Uh, well, I don't know if we're looking at something like George Orwell's 1984 or, or we've well surpassed George Orwell's 1984. Uh, here with legislation being, being put back um, with, for uh, listening devices on lampposts. I mean, for, for terrorism. What, terrorists gather on street corners and, and, and discuss plans under lampposts? I mean, this is ridiculous. We had a, a town yes. old, in Oldham where they put cameras on all the... You couldn't get in and out of the estate without going past the camera because they suspected that there were terrorist activity going on. What, in Oldham? In Oldham, it was... No, it was a heavy, heavily Muslim-populated area. Uh, and, of course, the national media streams, the major conglomerates and others believe that anyone who's different is a terrorist. Yeah, but your your government also um, invites a lot of the Muslims in, but then uses them, you know, to say that they're all terrorists. So it's kind of it seems like you know it's full circle where they uh, they say these people need to be watched because they're so dangerous. Welcome back, listeners. <laughs> yeah, I'm back. Uh, I've had a somewhat erratic, which is unusual for me, internet connection tonight. Um, we didn't actually we haven't yet covered it. Internet two. What do you know about Internet 2 and its, say, uh, implications for privacy? Yeah, they're basically trying to set up a second Internet, and they're going to sell it as, oh, look how great, it's so much faster, it's so much better, and they're going to basically <clears throat> get all the trendies to move over to it. Everything's probably going to be cloud-based, where you know everything you do, every document you write is saved online. And then eventually they're going to try to shut down the old web, and you're going to be stuck in this internet too, which is totally you know government run, which is going to be full of censorship. Basically, they're going to get everyone over there, and then they're going to just turn it into a giant nightmare more than it already is. You know? Yeah, I see. Yeah, I see what you mean there. Um, okay, I think yeah, we're coming up to time to finish up the show. So I'd like to thank you for coming on and. Um, if you have any website links you'd like to get out there, any information, extra information you haven't covered, just anything, um, now's your time just to finish, finish us up. Yeah, the best place to find me and all the stuff I do is just on Facebook. You can type my name in. It's M-I-K-A-E-L-T-H-A-L-E-N. Just shoot me a friend's request. I post all my articles and all the stuff I'm doing there. Um, I love any news tips anyone wants to give either on some big breaking news, so uh, hope to hear from some people. Awesome. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. You're welcome to stay on for the Dark Tech Show if you want to, and it's coming up right now. Um, and I'd definitely love to have you back on the show again in the future. We can talk, discuss that off the air. Um, thanks, everybody, for tuning in to Dawn's Diorama. Next week on the show, I'll have Holland van den Muenhoff. I hope I pronounced pronounce that right. He's a producer and writer of the film A Noble Lie about the Oklahoma City bombing. Um, so he'll be joining me to discuss that. So until then, have a great night, all over and out.